Okay, well, hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you. Thank you. So happy feels, to. Feels like an honor. では、なんていうのかな、もう全然始めていただいて大丈夫です。もう私もあの十五日に合わせたようにもういろいろありまして。<laughs> Many things happen to、oh. me. <laughs> Just like meeting this recording or your team or something.、Mm. Uh, um, my husband. Okay. My husband. 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 Hate relationships. m u k a s h i m u k a s h i t s a k i m u s m e g a o s h i t i k u r i r u n d i s k e d o w a t a s h i g a h o c h o f r i m a s h t e j i s a t s r u t o k a y o s a o s a w a g i o n a n k a m o s h i t a k o t o g a t a r a s h i w a t a s h i o b o i t a n a i n d e k e d o Even though I totally forgot about it, but my, my daughter told me that I was kind of crazy、uh, moving around with. Uh, the knife uh, holding. She knew to get a palace in Nanka, my palace. Commit suicide. So you took a bit of a zoo canke that the Shujingama Yone hungry mine and the coats you could see in the mask at all. So my husband passed away about four years ago, but we had special hate relationships. <sighs> もう昨日昨日あの彼とジーザスが同一人物だったっていうことに気がついて昨日ね。But yesterday I realized that the Jesus and my husband was just one thing. あのそれが分かったらもう。それだけで私はもうオールオッケー。Okay, I, I felt okay, I felt relieved,、oh, just realizing that. もう何も言うことがない、何もする必要がない。I don't have to say anything, I don't do anything more. そのように、精霊が教えてくれました。なんかもうその状態でいっぱいいっぱいなんでもうカーティさんにあの全部お任せしますお願いします<笑>あのここにいるもう本当にこれ私たちがここであのシェアをする目的でね集まっているんだっていうことにねここで癒されている癒されていく目的があって集まってますということです。Yeah, as we're coming closer and closer to the light and the truth, then everything else just gets flushed up into awareness for healing. で私たちがこの真実にですね向かってくるいくとですね光っていうのが急にバッと出てくるんですよね。So, today we have、uh, three themes, and I will speak on these three themes、uh, and then just see what else the Holy Spirit has for us.、Um, but the first one is devotion to God, and so I would like to just share with you some of my experience of coming into learning what it is. 
to be devoted to God and, uh, and how this can become a life, a life of devotion. So for myself, uh, my spiritual journey began with a, a big crash, a sports accident. And when that happened, I could no longer be the, the busy person that I had been. I could no longer live a life of uh, pushing myself and running around looking after everybody else, trying to follow my own ambitions and uh, try to make my own life happen. So when this accident happened, I was paralyzed. My wrists were broken and I had a brain damage, a head injury. And what it did for me was it shifted my attention from always being occupied with the external world and trying to find out what to do with my life and make my life successful. It shifted it from that focus to, to being still and dealing with my own emotions, my own thoughts and my own mind. So that was the beginning of my spiritual journey. I didn't know it at the time, <laughs> but that was the beginning of a spiritual path. So I learned a meditation technique and with this meditation practice, I strengthened in being able to bring my mind to a present place, to being here and being able to watch the thoughts that were arising and watch this uh, part of my mind that still wanted to race ahead to the future, to know the future, to figure out what was going to happen next and plan for it and let go of those thoughts, let go of that movement. And also I learned to watch my mind going the other way when it was always going to the past and getting caught in patterns of unfinished business, uh, wanting to go back and heal something that had happened in the past. I, so through this meditation technique, I started to become more and more devoted to being present and letting go of that part of my mind. And I didn't know this at the time, but that was the beginning of becoming devoted to God. So when I started to touch on this experience of peace within my mind, It felt so precious. That I realized that that was what I truly wanted. This presence of peace and the state of mind that is not busy, not trying, not working, not occupied with fear and concern. This presence of peace is the direction of coming back towards God. Because where is God? I can tell you where he's not. <laughs> he's not in the future. He's not in the past. He's not out there in the world. He's not in the idea of what would make me happy. He's not out there in a future relationship or a future outcome. So the very practice of coming back and desiring to be here, to be still, is the devotion to God. And there's a beautiful saying, be still and know that I am God. And this is, this is it, the gateway to experiencing the peace of God is within our own mind. It is a doorway that is found in the stillness within. 
And so as much as we become devoted to this inward direction, we're giving ourselves the opportunity to allow this shift of thinking and this shift of our desire, this shift of our focus from really a distraction or from looking outside to coming back and looking in to where it can be found. So when I first started devoting my life to healing my own mind, of course I saw the ego resistance to that and the ego doubt thoughts, the egoic attack thoughts that said, how could you be so selfish? How could you give so much time and attention to, to yourself, to, to being still? I was so used to being a good person, a nice person, a person that was so occupied with showing everyone that I loved them and cared about them, that it actually took a lot of devotion to being able to let go of that way of being and trust that if I gave that attention to my own relationship with God, with my own healing, that it was actually not just for me. It, it was for the whole universe. And there are even witnesses. You know, at first, and everyone goes through this, there are people who will show up and reflect those fears and those doubts that are within our own mind. And they'll say things like, well, what's going to become of you if this is all you're going to do? <laughs> what will become of your life? What about money? What about the future? How are you going to be taken care of if this becomes your first priority? So, and again, that's where our devotion to God comes in to be able to see these doubt thoughts for what they are. Because one of the most powerful teachings that Jesus shared 2,000 years ago and is all the way through A Course in Miracles is seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all things shall be added. That means put this devotion first, put this presence, being in direct contact with this presence first and then Everything that you need will be taken care of for you. Why? Because you're giving yourself to God. You're giving your life to God. And when you put yourself in God's hands, then he can take care of you. When you're turning inward and wanting to listen to the Holy Spirit, then you can hear the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the voice for God. And so this voice, as Jesus promises in the Course, and it's true, <laughs> will tell you where to go, what to do. will even give you the words that need to be spoken. So this is both a very beautiful, high devotional idea, and it's also practical. Very, very practical. Because that's important. To just have spiritual ideas uh, isn't enough. We, we need to know that this works. We need to know that we are going to be taken care of if we stop looking after ourselves. We need to know that we have a parent, you know, a loving parent that is going to step in for us and take care of us. And so that has been my experience. My prayer was, okay, I'm willing to trust. I'm willing to go for this. And you're going to have to show me. You're going to have to show up and guide me and take care of me. And I'm very, very happy to share with you that this life, since I've been giving it over to God to guide, over to the Holy Spirit, it has been absolutely miraculous.
absolutely miraculous. And I could share an example from my story about that. So when I first had that sports accident and I then started to go deeper into my spiritual journey, I was given from the government uh, accident compensation. I was given a percentage of my wage that I had been earning through my job. And I was very grateful to receive that. And I was doing uh, my physical rehabilitation. And I had a psychologist supporting me and a, an occupational therapist supporting me. And six months later, I, I still had a lot of head injury symptoms. I was very tired. I had chronic fatigue, uh, migraine headaches all day, every day. And, but as I was starting to do this forgiveness work, I, did, I was starting to learn uh, what increased the pain and the headaches and what seemed to alleviate the pain and alleviate the tension. And as I got deeper and deeper into this forgiveness work, I realized that even though it looked like it was the government, New Zealand government, paying me, <laughs> supporting me to heal, I started to realize that this was the universe supporting me. This was actually the spirit coming through and supporting me. And the, I came to that realization when I started giving everything over and seeing that the Holy Spirit was the one in charge or Jesus was the one in charge behind the whole plan. So either my whole life was messed up and something had gone terribly wrong and now I'm dependent on the government to fix me and help me. Or perhaps this was all part of this prearranged plan and Jesus was in charge of it. And so the support that I was going to be receiving from this moment on was going to be for the healing of my mind. And that's the way I chose to see it. And so I started studying The Course in Miracles, and six months later, I met David Hofmeister. He came to New Zealand, and I felt the strong guidance that I was to come back. I was to go to America and uh, start volunteering and supporting him in his ministry. And I thought, well, sure enough, my accident compensation will stop when I leave New Zealand, because that's the law. So I called my caseworker and I told her that I wanted to leave New Zealand and go to America. And I was starting to study A Course in Miracles and do forgiveness work. And that I was noticing this healing happening in my mind and starting to feel this inner inspiration that I hadn't felt in my life for a long time since before the accident. And my caseworker said to me, oh, well, we can just write that into your rehabilitation plan. <laughs> so she insisted on continuing to pay me when I came over to America. So I was in America for three months and I was deepening in my devotion and I realized, well, this is my life. I, I don't want to do anything else. All I want is to follow God's plan and practice forgiveness and be of service. And so after three months, I called my caseworker and I said, look, I'm feeling so much better. The migraines, the headaches are lessening now. Uh, I still have to sleep every afternoon, but I, I know that I'm healing. And she said, that is wonderful. We will keep paying you. <laughs> <laughs> and by then I knew it was the Holy Spirit. It would, I could feel it in my heart. There is this keep going, just keep saying yes, keep putting the kingdom of heaven first and, and be shown that everything will continue to be provided in miraculous ways. Three months later, 
I was feeling even more healed, <laughs> less pain, less headaches, less needing to rest. And at that point, I felt, wow, I have to stop this accident compensation now. I know that I don't have a head injury. I know that everything has worked together for good. And I called her and she said, well, just three more months. I just want to continue to support you for three more months. And so I was willing to accept the support above and beyond uh, what I had ever imagined. And then after that three months, I said to her, yeah, we need to stop now. I, I know that I'm healed. <laughs> mm. And then I wanted to know that if, I always knew that I would be taken care of. I don't know why, but I always knew that I would be supported. And so then my prayer was, show me that if others go on this journey, they too will be supported. Uh, and that this divine providence um, takes care of everyone and everything. And so then I, I spent the next few years just watching my prayer being answered and watching as various friends just put this awakening journey first and put their, their prayer life first with this prayer to be used to say okay I just want to serve you I will go where you would have me go I will do what you would have me do and then I watched as they received this miracles happening in their lives too for example a big tax return right when the money was needed um, or an inheritance from a relative right as the prayer was okay spirit I don't know how I'm going to be provided for now and so I've been shown over and over again through my own experience and watching those around me that this devotion to God is truly the devotion to being taken care of. And yeah, it really takes a lot of faith, which actually moves us into our second topic faith in God yeah, it really takes a lot of faith to trust that there is a source you know, beyond our own means or beyond our own realm of thinking that is there for us and for me the times where faith was called upon was when I was going through doubt you know I was going through periods of uh, dismantling where life as I knew it was I uh, was changing um, and um, I think the most some of the most powerful experiences that I had were when I just found myself on my knees uh, having to put my faith in God and having to put my faith in a source that would, that must knew more than I knew. And so it's very important to to have this direction for our thinking. There's a line from the Course coming to my mind. Why fly with the wings of a sparrow when you can soar with the wings of an eagle? And that is the difference in the experience that we have when we're trusting in our own strength versus being willing to put our faith in God and trust that when we do this we are going to be lifted and shown a different way and um, yeah I think every step of the way on this journey has felt like a leap of faith
And this leap of faith has had to be taken over and over and over again. Um, to go into the unknown, to let go of the past, to say, yes, I will follow, yes, I will trust. And so if you're coming up against your first big leap of faith, it's helpful to know that this is just the first and there will be many, many more, you know, many, many more. Because when you first feel like you, you have this big leap to take, just in saying, yes, I want to give my life to you, the fear is that your life is going to change so radically and so much that something, it, it will be frightening and terrible. And it's not the case at all. It's more that there's just a leap into the unknown, but you're actually leaping into a higher or a more expanded awareness of who you are as spirit. It's the opposite to what the ego says. It's not devastation, it's a blessing. <laughs> and the more we get used to taking these leaps of faith, the more we strengthen until this point where leaping, you know, leaping and, and saying, yes, I don't know what's going to happen to me, but I just say yes. And when that becomes really familiar, then it, life actually becomes really joyful and it becomes this experience of living in the unknown. Living in the unknown. Another word for faith is trust. And the development of trust section in the manual for teachers is a very helpful uh, section because it lays out these different stages that everyone goes through. And some of the earlier stages involve uh, where things in your life seem to fall away or even you could perceive that they're being taken away. And if it's perceived this way, that things are being taken away, then it can be distressing. But he does explain there that it's, it's more that as your mind is aligning to your spiritual journey or to this awakening purpose, then things, relationships that no longer serve this purpose, they will naturally just start to fall away from your awareness. And there's a sorting out practice or a sorting out phase that the mind is going through as we're realizing what is valuable and what is not valuable based on does it serve this purpose of awakening or not? Does it serve to try to maintain myself in the world as I have been, which is not what I actually want? <laughs> so there's a sorting out phase, but because um, our identity is becomes not just with like our body, but our, de our identity or our self-concept includes the world that we're in relationship with. Jesus says your self-concept includes the whole world as you see it, the whole world as you perceive it. So you're, what you become identified with is who you are, how you are, you know, how you like things to be. And that's why you can, we can get disturbed if someone comes in and, and changes things around without us knowing about it. It's like part of ourself that's being messed with. <laughs> uh, and so the, the spirit is finding a way to, to help our attention shift from our identity being so attached to this world and the things in this world and the ways that we interact with it and relate to it to through forgiveness to let those go and redirect our identity and our attention to identifying 
with this practice of forgiveness, this purpose of letting go and returning to being with the spirit and as the spirit. And of course, as we do this, then what's no longer needed can, can naturally fall away from, from our attention. And that's also where the faith comes in, like really trusting that as things change, that it is all for this purpose of forgiveness and that it is all in the direction of strengthening in our identity with spirit. And I think it takes a lot of faith to trust that we can do this, that we can do this. And I have uh, many friends who've become very, at times, disillusioned and felt that they should be further along than they are. They should be healed by now. They should be over this um, struggle by now. And I always remind them of the fact that mystics and saints uh, in the past, before A Course in Miracles came along, <laughs> mystics and saints would go off into caves for years, decades, just with the same desire to heal their mind and release the ego and know themselves as God created them. And so this journey is, is not something that happens just with the click of their fingers in terms of the whole process. But yes, salvation is now, and yes, we can expect miracles now, and we can expect to wake up now. That is a beautiful attitude and a very important attitude to have, that yes, I will be with God every moment that I desire to be. And yet, the, um, the transformation of consciousness that we're going through involves bringing the darkness to the light, bringing all that has been unconscious, all of the unconscious beliefs in the mind, up into awareness to be healed, to be forgiven. And we do not have personal control over how long it takes. So in my experience, it's been, I've approached the healing in a way like gardening. So if there's a, you've got a garden that has been um, overgrown with weeds and neglected, then some of those weeds in the garden, they all need to be pulled out and cleared out of the garden. But some of those weeds have roots that are very, very deep. They've been there for a long time. And it's an excavation task to clear away all of the dirt, all of the um, earth that is holding those roots in place so that they can be completely uncovered and the entire weeds can be pulled out of the garden. Because as you know, if you have ever done any gardening, if you just pull the tops of the weeds off, they just regrow. And it's very much the same when it comes to our mind. We have to be patient and we have to actually take the time to honor this process of putting on our gardening gloves, <laughs> be willing to get down in the dirt on our hands and knees and with prayer, with the spirit you know, in our mind and in our heart, be willing to look upon the weeds and clear away the earth and uncover you know, every part of the roots so that they can be loosened and pulled up and removed from our mind completely so that we're truly free.
So when I first started uh, looking at the idea of specialness, um, I took a family trip after I'd been studying The Course in Miracles for a year. And I'd been away from New Zealand for six months. And then I, I went back to New Zealand for a visit and to get a visa to come back to America with. And when I went there, I, I was visiting with my family again and um, I sounded different. I, was, I sounded like a walking, talking Course in Miracles book <laughs> after being so immersed in it for so long. And I remember my, my father, my dad, he was quite upset. And he said, you've changed. I want my daughter back. And so I had to face some of these thoughts of upsetting people by being devoted to God, you know, upsetting those that I loved. And uh, he asked me, or my mother um, also said, well, can you just talk differently? Is that possible? And I went into prayer because I was willing to, to be truly helpful. And I asked, can I try to speak differently so that I don't upset him. And I just felt, no, I can't. I would be out of integrity with my relationship with the Holy Spirit if I tried to behave in a way just so that I don't disturb my dad's feelings. And so I went, I said, no, I can't. I can't talk differently. I'm just in the middle of my mind training. I'm, I'm practicing forgiveness. I can be quiet if that's what's most helpful. And so I just went into prayer and, and I was dealing with this, these feelings of guilt, these feelings of specialness that I, yeah, I felt that I, I, I am his daughter. I want him to know that I love him. I don't want to let him down. But beyond that, when I let go of these thoughts and practice forgiveness, I knew above all else, I wanted to get, be in alignment with, with the Holy Spirit. And so my prayer was, show me that this is the greatest good of everyone. That if I put you first, you know, this will be a blessing. And it took a lot of faith to do that, to stay in my room and stay in prayer. And then the next day, both of my parents came knocking on my door and they said, Kirsten, your brother, this is my, my younger brother, is, um, is going through a really difficult time with his pregnant girlfriend and we're really upset about it. And you're the only one who's not caught up in the family drama. Can you help us? And that was the answer to my prayer. It's like, oh, thank you. I was shown that, that me being at peace and just sitting there practicing forgiveness was the greatest gift. And then I went and joined with them and, and it was such a beautiful connect, a real communication because they could see they were caught up in the mother role. My mother was caught in the mother role, which she didn't want. She's, of course, a miracle student. <laughs> My dad was caught up in the father role. They were caught up in trying to be parents and you know their son was in his 30s and so they they laughed at this idea like what are we doing <laughs> still trying to rescue him and play parents but when your emotions are caught up you know it's it's difficult sometimes and so we joined together in in seeing what was playing out and you know we didn't use the words let's give it to the holy spirit but it was felt it was felt in our joining so those were some of, that was one of the early experiences I had of, of dealing with specialness and putting forgiveness and the Holy Spirit first before, um, in the past, Kirsten would have been there, you know, trying to help her brother, trying to help everyone find the solution with the problem. And so that was my first experience of turning towards the solution being prayer and then being shown from prayer what the solution was or how I could be truly helpful. 
And I remember not long after that, I returned back to the States and I remember saying, okay, Holy Spirit, that's good. I'm done with specialness. I've healed specialness. I went back to New Zealand. I was truly helpful. I'm a devoted Course of Miracles student, so I probably don't have to deal with guilt <laughs> ever again. <laughs> and uh, just like this analogy of the weed, you know, of the weeds, that was perhaps one root of the weed that I had uncovered and cleared away through prayer. But yeah, it's a very deep journey. And what I noticed uh, for myself was never to say that. You know? Never to say, oh good, I'm done with that. Anytime I said that, it would pop up again and I would feel disturbed by it or I'd feel disappointed or I would defend against it as if this should not be happening. I've already dealt with this. I should be over this by now. And so I learned to stay very humble, to stay very open to perhaps I've never fully healed yet. Perhaps I still need the Holy Spirit's help. Perhaps I still need Jesus to show me the way. And when that prayer is there, then it, the gift, you can feel it. Can't you feel the gift of that openness? It's not weakness to say, I'm open to hearing your wisdom. I'm open to receiving your help, your support. That is wisdom, actually. <laughs> it is very wise to continue to put ourselves in God's hands. And we're either then receiving the support and receiving the gift, or we're in an experience of being completely aligned with that support and with the gift and it's pouring through us as our true identity. And the third topic which makes me smile is God always loves us. God always loves us. Mm -hmm. So if you think of this, the statement, God always loves us, as being true. then what that means is that you can learn to tell the difference between the voice for God, which is the voice that is always going to be saying, I love you, I'm with you, you're innocent, as opposed to the voice of the ego, which is the voice of doubt and failure which always recommends separation as a solution. So that's the first um, way that I'd like to approach talking about, about this fact that God always loves us. Because the metaphysics of the course are crystal clear that God is love, love is real, and all else is illusion. God's will for us is perfect happiness. Knowing ourself is absolutely loved and absolutely innocent. His will for us is not pain and pleasure or happiness and sadness. And so we can, with this knowledge, we can discern the difference very clearly of when we are aligned with 
the voice for God and with this thought system of the spirit as opposed to the thought system of the ego. And in my experience, when I used to tell that story about having a, a sports accident and a head injury, I was telling the story one time a, a few years ago, and I was saying, oh, yes, it was what I needed. I needed um, a big hit over the head to wake up. I needed the Holy Spirit to do that, to wake me up. And I was with my friend one day and he said, huh, Kirsten, do you mean to say that you believe that the Holy Spirit hit you over the head and did that to you? And I said, well, yes, I, I do believe that. And I had to take a look at it. I had to take a look at that and it's like, I, I could feel it. And when I really felt into that perception, I uncovered that I, I had a confusion that, that God still does have something to do with, with pain and suffering and that I needed to go through that experience in order to wake up and learn of God. And it's not true. God's will for us is perfect happiness. It, does not involve pain. His plan does not involve suffering. His plan does not involve needing darkness in order to learn of the light or needing pain in order to learn of truth. That's the ego's interpretation. And so I could, after like really going into that and exploring that idea, I, I asked for clarification about it from Jesus and, and I could see that it was the kind of excuse that Kirsten needed. You know? I was so caught up in my busy doings, my busyness, my personality self that I remember at that time I was praying to stop. I didn't know who to pray to. I didn't have a connection with God or Jesus or any spiritual um, guide. But in my mind, I was calling out to stop and, and be still, but I was afraid to be still. I didn't have a good reason to be still. And that was the kind of excuse that I needed to be able to say to the world, I'm sorry, I can't be that person anymore. Look, I've got broken wrists. You know, I, can't, I can't do that. I, ca I can't keep coming to work and driving the car. Even though they called me on the phone and asked me if I would, they said, we'll get you a driver. You know, we'll get you a scribe, someone who can write your notes for you, but please, we want you to come back to work. And I can see that my personality self, Kirsten, would have gone. If she didn't have broken wrists, she would have gone back to work. But that was the kind of excuse that I needed. Is it God's will that I have broken wrists? No. He wouldn't wish pain on his beloved child. How could a loving God wish that? So it was definitely my perception. But later on, as I could look back upon it all and see, wow, it all worked together for my good. I needed, I personally, my self-concept needed <laughs> it to be like that in order to give myself permission to, to let my mind go in a different direction, or to start putting meditation first and spiritual practice first. And where was the loving God in all of that? God is this loving presence 
within my heart, within my mind. This loving presence of God is always here and has always been here and doesn't change and doesn't go away. But I'm only in touch with it when, when I've let go of everything else and come back to it. And when I first began um, the mind training of learning the difference between when am I listening to the spirit and when am I listening to the ego, this practice actually started energetically just soon after that accident because I felt quite, uh, my energy levels were depleted and I noticed that when I was listening to conversations for example if my dad was talking about the weather and the traffic and the politics in new zealand i would start to get very tired very quickly and i would say to him you've got 10 minutes with me make it count and he would stop and go oh okay what do i actually want to talk to her about and I noticed when I was with, for example, my mother, who was on her spiritual journey, and we would talk about what was really on our heart, talk about our emotions or our feelings or our anything spiritual, I noticed how nourishing that felt for my heart, for my mind. And as I started to get into the course, I noticed the same thing, that when my, my mind was focused on what heals, it energized me, it, he, it literally healed me and gave me the, the nourishment and the energy. And that practice has continued to go ever deeper into the subtleties around when is their compromise versus being completely aligned with the Holy Spirit, with God's will, and noticing the difference, feeling the difference. One is loving, one gives energy, and the other feels like a drain or a strain. It takes, it takes energy. In some way, it feels unloving. And I think it takes a lot of watching and noticing to to really learn the difference and it was helpful initially for me to see physically what difference did it make for me how did my shoulders feel you know, how did my stomach feel how did my eyes feel and actually noticing how how it felt there's a way of tuning in to is this the spirit is this the spirit's plan for me or not. And where this brings you to um, is more and more into this alignment with, with God's will. And what I found for myself was that, you know, many years ago I would compromise for days or weeks or you know, months at a time, I didn't even know I was compromising, but I didn't, I wasn't praying to, to follow a higher power. <laughs> and now what I found is that it's, it's not possible to compromise. I, I actually can't. It's like my, it's like being a puppet. And, you know, a puppet with a, a crossbow and the, the crossbow makes the puppet move. Well, if the Holy Spirit has now got the crossbow and is the one in charge of making this puppet move, if the Holy Spirit is not saying walk, then you can't walk. But if the Spirit is not saying, I want you to meditate now, then you can't meditate. <laughs> so it's a beautiful thing to, to be off the ego's 
strings when the ego would always have you be people pleasing and doing things because you you need to keep the world going and um, for all of these other purposes and reasons that are out there that are external and more and more as you just let go of that motivation and and give yourself this permission to say hey, I don't feel that. I just want to follow what is truly your will for me. Then it is as if that the ego's purpose gets dropped and you find yourself aligning with the spirit and then being moved by a loving guide. So, those are beautiful topics to speak on. Devotion to God, faith to God, and God always loves us. So, thank you. I just, um, I invite if, Noriko, if you have, if any of those topics you want me to just speak on a little bit more, if you have a question about any of them, um, just let me know unless that feels complete. あの、今終わった感じはあるんですけれども、何かありますかね。あ、いいえ、大丈夫です。Thank <笑> you very much. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you. Thank you. We are so loved. Okay, thank you, angels. I'm so grateful. Attention. <laughs> <laughs>